It's an honor to be asked to participate in this great and momentous occasion. I thank Leslie Bowman and the Foundation for extending the invitation. I'm really excited about all of this, being a part of a ceremony itself and about my anticipation of the millions, trillions, millions of visitors who will make the pilgrimage to Monticello over the years and receive the benefits of all the hard work that has been put into the visitor center by so many people at the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. This is an important moment in Virginia, but I also believe for the entire country. The foundation is indeed lucky to have had the great stewardship of Dan Jordan for so many years, and now it can continue the tradition with Leslie Bowman. I must say that due to the somewhat quirky origins of my association with Monticello, I've never actually entered the old visitor center at all. I never had that experience. And I look forward sometime after I'm not dashing off to Australia, which I'll be doing in about two hours, to starting, to starting from the beginning here at this new site and going through the process just like everyone else. I've thought long and hard about what I wanted to say in the few minutes that have been allotted to me, and I promise you I will take only a few minutes. There's so much to say, but a few things came immediately to mind. The first, not surprisingly, given my interest in the past, is how all of this began and what it says about the nature of this place, this country, and the history and legacy that we as Americans share. I thought back to 241 years ago when the young Thomas Jefferson, unknown to the world at that time, began the process of building a house atop a small mountain, a thing he had dreamed of doing since his youth. It wasn't an easy project. Hired laborers, enslaved people that Jefferson summoned from a nearby <coughs> plantation, performed the arduous task of leveling the mountain and creating the foundation for what would become Jefferson's architectural masterpiece. And then I thought of what happened next. Three years later, Jefferson brought his bride, Martha Whale Skelton, to what really was just the beginning of a dwelling, hoping to have a long life there with her. Unfortunately for them, that was not to be. The story of the young couple's arrival at Monticello and their first days in the honeymoon cottage is well known in Jefferson lore. What is less well known is that a young girl of 15 arrived with, with or soon after the young couple. Betty Brown was Martha Jefferson's personal maid. She left behind a large family, the Hemingses, that would soon join her on the mountain. No one can really know what her dreams in life were at that time. Her status, of course, limited the scope of her realistic hopes and dreams. But we do know, with the benefit of history's 2020 hindsight, that she would spend almost 60 years on the mountain, living here generations after the death of Martha Jefferson and many years after Jefferson's own death in 1826. Of course, the young architect and builder would go on to become one of the architects of American democracy. And that is the prime reason that people the world over know who he is and make the trek up the mountain to his house to see the lovely gardens and to take in the stunning vistas. But there are other important reasons that Monticello should be a destination for all who are interested in American history and what it means to be an American. Perhaps no other place I could think of presents so clearly that peculiar American combination of soaring and necessary idealism and harsh reality. It must never be forgotten that in addition to being the home of one of the world's great men, Monticello was a slave plantation, maybe the best known in the world besides the fictional Terra. It was home to hundreds of African Americans, a number of them like Betty Brown, who lived here with their families for generations. Their connection to this place was not, came not through their legal ownership of it. They were here under tragic circumstances, the country's engagement with chattel slavery. Labor, family life, bearing and raising children, the memories of mothers and fathers, the burial of their dead in this place, give them a moral and historical claim to this site as well. And to the great credit of Dan Jordan's leadership, which again will continue with Leslie Bowman, that fact has been recognized at Monticello to an extent unmatched at any other public history site. 
So Monticello stands as one of Jefferson's most important and enduring legacies. Just as he had attended, as we can see by the museum he made of his entrance hallway, it is more than just a family's legal residence, a place of arresting beauty. It is a site where some of the most compelling dramas of American history were played out under the eyes of the man whose fingerprints are all over that history. Slavery in all its aspects, labor, people as property, the owners and the own, linked together by slavery's law and by blood, can be found here. It is worth keeping in mind that for many Americans, most importantly, the numerous school children who have come and will come here on field trips, Monticello has been and will be their only firsthand experience with an American slave plantation. Therefore, it is a place to come not only to celebrate the contributions and genius of one man, although that surely must be done, and rightly so. It is a place to do what Jefferson loved to do, to think hard and intelligently about the country we live in, the awe-inspiring things and the awful, a place to learn and to grow in knowledge. It provides the perfect vista from which to contemplate and prepare for America's future, made possible in large measure by Jefferson's vision. Thank you very much for coming out on this, well, it's getting better day now. <laughs> Let the learning continue apace, beginning at this stunning new addition to Monticello. Thank you.